Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, I must confess that I dropped in when Tim gave his presentation, so uh, I did read the summaries of the other two presentations. And I think that basically we might conclude at the end of the day uh, that the main problem is that this room is not packed with people. Um, are we the only ones that are worrying, worrying about the state of Dutch archaeology? Or is, is people that are not here, are they all happy? Are they all busy doing what they love to do? And how are we going to bring the results of today to those people? Because if we want to change things, then this has to come out. We'll see. Okay, um, while discussing uh, Dutch archaeology with Kate, um, I slowly grew into the notion that perhaps it would be nice to give a presentation here. And this is the, when you see the, the, the title, and the idea is that uh, we have spent a lot of time in Dutch archaeology uh, over the last 20 years reorganizing ourselves. And over the last 20 years we have again and again told, uh, well, told every audience that we could find that this Article 9 of the Valletta Treaty is so important. And still, it is, well, it's still not really covered with legislation. So, Basically, I think this is how we could re-establish the societal relevance of archaeology. Um, for me, this presentation is rather new. I'm rather accustomed to giving a presentation on the basis of science, of doing research. Um, but this is a very personal impression, based, simply based on the fact that I've been in Dutch archaeology since uh, the early 90s. And while talking to people in university with commercial firms um, and so on, I really slowly got the idea that what we lack in Dutch archaeology is a forum to discuss uh, what goes well and what doesn't go so well. So that's why I started a Facebook discussion group uh, seven, eight months ago. And I checked yesterday, there are 407 people reading these messages. So I think it's in, uh, if you see the total volume of Dutch archaeology is, I don't know, 1,000, 1,500, including all students. It's a rather big group of people. And one of the things that uh, I found very interesting in, this, in these discussions is the fact that people were not stating, oh, but the state service in Amersfoort, they are doing it all wrong, or these commercial firms, they are doing all the bad work, and so on. People were very... Um, well, detached, talking about their own personal experiences and basically trying to, to find common ground, so this is really <coughs> nice. So, um, although it's a very personal story, I must confess that it was last Friday that I um, uh, posted the major point of this lecture on this Facebook group, simply to see how wrong I was. And, um, of course, there were some comments, but no one really said, Please don't go there. So that's why I'm here. Uh, this is the only picture in my lecture, so uh, it's not to spoil you. Uh, so this is a Facebook group, and I called it Archaeology 3.0, which is a very uh, topical way of describing new stages. And this is a bit the idea that uh, Tim also presented a bit about the pre malta system, which is. Um, system one, and then you might say that the current system is system two. And I think we all feel that uh, there are some things that, uh, well, let's say, uh, are open for, uh, for changes. So let's talk about how we want Dutch archaeological heritage management archaeology to be organized. And let's call this vision archaeology 3.0. That's the idea. Um, and what I want to do in this lecture is to talk you through the developments as I have perceived them over the last 20 years. Um, and I, I, I will start in this pre malta system. Um, and I'm not trying to advocate that we should return to this system. But it is, it is really good to know that this, well, for several decades, this has been uh, normal. That archaeological research, excavations, has been was restricted to governmental bodies. No commercial firms at all. So the state service did many projects, big projects. Uh, the provinces had their own facilities. Um, and at that time, uh, every archaeologist of the province was also an employee of the state service. So there was a 
closely knit community there, uh, only a small number of the larger municipalities uh, uh, carried out their own excavations. There was this National Museum of Antiquities and there were the universities. One of the, well, if you simply add up the number of people working in this uh, pre malta system, it's quite clear that it's so much smaller that the number of excavations um, is really restricted on a yearly basis. So the number of projects that we now have is much larger. Um, one of the things that is intriguing, I'm working at a university, when I go abroad and I talk to my foreign colleagues, they ask me, what has happened in Dutch archaeology? Did you stop excavating? And the first time this, I, I was asked this question, I didn't understand. But the, the, the issue is that in this pre malta system, all these big projects, um, I was going to say that they ended up in very nice interna internationally visible publications, but that was the goal at least. Um, but these projects that, did, that were published, they were published in such a way that they were visible internationally. And now we have this, these cubic meters of paper of standard reports published in Dutch, which are not seen abroad at all. So the perception is that Dutch archaeology has disappeared. Okay, then the Malta developments. Now one of the things that um, uh, at least I noticed in the early 90s, but perhaps this, uh, this has says much about me, because that's when I graduated, um, is that there was a transition in many municipalities that traditionally the archaeologists was in, let's say, a culture department, so together with an art historian and a historian. Uh, so you might say uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a setting where the product of archaeology was uh, um, appreciated. And I think that one by one, the archaeologists in, this, in the cities went to another department. So uh, let's, let's call that spatial planning. And of course the idea was that it allowed these archaeologists to uh, be more easily found by those people involved in all the projects, in all the planning, the spatial planning. Which is really good because that basically is the bottom line of how many projects start. But, so that's a plus. But it's also a negative result. Because we then ended up in an environment in which our direct colleagues were not so much interested in our products. These natural partners were well, sitting in another part of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the town hall or whatever. Okay, so then we had a major economic boom in the Netherlands. And as a result of the close ties to uh, spatial planning, we had a major boom in archaeological heritage management. It is a, a huge boom, um, which lasted, um, um, well, perhaps something like 15 years. Um, so, of course, that's positive. But we have to realize that in this setting, um, archaeology became a product which was delivered for consumers that were not interested. It was something which had a box that had to be ticked. It was a problem in spatial planning that had to be solved, like nature values or pollution of the soil. Um, and as long as this economic boom lasted, this was perhaps not so much a problem. Okay, then as you all know we um, ran into a major economic crisis um, resulting in less projects, less spatial development projects. Um, now when you drive from Groningen to, uh, to Amersfoort, you see that every major city in the north has its own business park developed. You might say the infrastructure is developed but there are no offices nothing is produced there. So you might say that in, at, at the start of the economic crisis a lot of development continued but these areas there are in terms of archaeology uh, finished. So it will take a long long time for these areas to even have a new uh, project uh, on the basis of spatial planning. Um, okay so less projects but I think we also have less money per project. That's one also the, you can also see that in the if you look at the, the results of all the building of all the construction firms. And if you think about it, I mean if you have 
the assignment to create a bridge or a road or whatever, you do need a certain amount of concrete. So that part of the budget is fixed. So you can imagine that if you get less money, there is more and more tension related to what I would call non-essentials, such as archaeology. Uh, why do we need an, ex an excavation? Can, can we not do it in a cheaper way? Why do we need commercial archaeologists? Can we do it with uh, amateurs and so on? So there's a lot of pressure on archaeology as a result of, uh, of these developments. And there's um, a fourth step. Uh, a few years ago we have seen a reorganization of Dutch archaeology that municipalities now are the prime agents, you might say, in uh, archaeological heritage man management. And uh, when I grew up, there was this rather famous comparison of archaeologists with uh, rabbits, which were asked to guard a field full of uh, carrots. And uh, so there was a, let's say, spatial planner that walked up to an archaeologist uh, from a municipality or even from state service and said, well, I want to develop this, this archaeological site. Yeah, yeah, it's a big problem. We need to preserve it. Yeah, but we cannot preserve. We have to uh, develop it. And uh, then the, the, this municipality archaeology would say, well, okay, if that's the case, then it needs to be excavated. It has to be excavated. That's legislation. Oh, oh, and who can do that? I can. So it's really strange. You might say that in this old system, that we both were guardians, but also the excavators. So while that has been solved, I think we, what we've now created is something like what I would what you might call a negative rabbit. So you have this municipality which on the one hand has the, the obligation to take care of archaeological heritage and at the same time has an uh, urge to develop areas for new buildings, for new industry and so on. So within this organization of the municipality there is a lot of pressure on this, this archaeologist to make his project smaller. Okay, so I'm not that optimistic on the present situation. I didn't raise my hand, my hand when Tim asked us to do so. Um, I think for spatial planners, archaeology is a problem. It's not an asset. I've never been involved, at least in a project where the spatial planner said, well, how, how, what are we going to do with archaeology? I'm looking forward to your excavation. Um, and the same relates to municipalities. And I think that as a result, we fail to show society that archaeology is relevant. And that's not anyone's fault but ours. We fail to show society that archaeology is sufficiently relevant. Um, if you talk with people about this point, the first thing that everyone starts to think about is new legislation. Well, we need to reorganize Dutch archaeology and uh, we have to make the rules stricter so that archaeology becomes more uh, more visible and it cannot be avoided and so on. And uh, we could have discussions about the role of municipalities, uh, about another financial system. And I, indeed, I think that both of these aspects need to be reassessed. But the bottom line is, why should politicians care? The bottom line is, where does the money come from and why should they bother to invest in archaeology? And that's not going to be solved with new legislation if we don't have an answer to this question. And uh, the answer to that question is that we, as archaeologists, and I'm basically not talking to you, but I'm talking to all the persons that are not sitting here. So talk to all your friends. Why are we not in, a, in Armsford? We need to convince society that archaeology is relevant. And only if we have succeeded in doing so, then we can talk about reorganizing uh, the system by means of new legislation. And if you think about it, and I've read Boudewijn's summary, and I think it's extremely in line with what you said this morning, every project needs to start with definition of the societal relevance. And we are used in our PVAs and whatever to define uh, the societal relevance. But I think we should define it together. Um, the train uh, uh, to Armstrong, I only had written down def defined together with finance, but perhaps that's too, too easy, because uh, if they're not interested, uh, an archaeological project should be uh, 
should add to the, to, let's say, the local or regional narrative. And the only way to guarantee that is to involve um, uh, the government archaeologists. But I think we should also, in this early stage of a project, simply invite the mayor of a municipality, for example, and to, uh, to hear uh, how, um, how the politics in this municipality can be involved. What, what are their in interests? What are they interested in? What do they find relevant? Okay. Um, okay, this societal relevance. Um, I've slowly grown into this three, uh, well, the system of three points. I think that archaeology traditionally is extremely strong in what I would call public outreach, sending out the message. But this is a very 20th century kind of connection with society. Um, as an example, I can write a new uh, interesting story on a website, but how do I know that the audience that might be interested finds it? So sending on, uh, alone is not the solution. Um, public participation, that's also uh, increasingly uh, important. Um, only last, last week I read about an excavation where they uh, incorporated children, or you can talk about uh, uh, excavation with amateurs. But I think that the really intriguing bit is to uh, talk about public-private cooperation. So that means non-archaeologists sitting at your desk at the early start of a project and not telling them what needs to be done, but asking them what do you want? How can we uh, reach your goals by means of an archaeological project? And this is really difficult and it also asks uh, new qualities for archaeologists. We have all been trained, at least my generation, as being, let's say, the expert within an organization. I know what's good for archaeology. But that's not how we should train our students anymore. We should try to prepare them for these kind of meetings. Where, yes, they are experts in their fields, but they, it's not only their domain, archaeology. It's the domain we share with other uh, uh, organizations. So they should be able to communicate and to understand what kind of issues are at role um, in politics, for example. Okay, if or when we succeed in establishing societal relevance, of actually we may rethink our archaeological heritage management system. Um, personally, no, I rephrase that. We all know that the Valletta Treaty is, uh, is a piece of paper which is very abstract. So all nations in Europe were free to develop their own system. And I would like to show uh, um, two last um, slides with, um, well, models. One of the models that I find very attractive is this Danish model, in which the regional museums have simply been given an extra task, that is to take care of the archaeology in their region. As a result, one of Tim's problems is solved as well, because you have this organization where all the knowledge is maintained. Yep. Uh, public outreach is of course also already arranged from the outs from the outside of a project. So that might be something that we might discuss. <coughs> um, the role of, ex uh, of universities is also something that Tim already addressed. Um, I know that when we started the discussion, Dutch archaeology said we want anything but the English system in which universities were detached from the archaeological market and we failed. It is, it is the truth, let's face it. Uh, universities have their own agendas, their own uh, forces which drive them uh, to international projects and so on. Um, and that's a waste. And one of the results of this is that um, um, the archaeological expertise that might be needed in Dutch archaeology uh, can easily be overestimated. Universities are extremely small. Um, and how are we going to train these experts if this expertise is not available at the universities? So, you sh if we try to reconnect all these groups into regional centers of expertise, then these might be substantial enough to, uh, um, well, to work. This is my very last slide. So I, I have the impression that Dutch archaeology stands at an important point in its history. And we need to bring together all factions within archaeology to redefine our dis discipline. It's, it's basically what it is. And do not wait for politicians to feel the urge to change things for you. But make them feel the urge. I mean, we should go out and simply act 
and tell them what's wrong. How many of you are involved in local politics? Oh, there are oh that's good. That's two. Well, there are... Oh, oh, perfect. A bit more. Well, there are over more than 400, 400 municipalities. So most of our mayors or politicians have never spoken to an archaeologist who told them what was wrong. How are they to know? Thank you.